Short story by Carl B. Clark. Betancourt was an investment analyst of some kind for a broker in town, and he did pretty well. Well enough to live in the country and keep a pair of sleek Arabian horses, plus a couple of big, expensive automobiles and a box-shaped modern house that won an award in a magazine. He also kept a young, expensive wife who looked just fine in that setting and who never really had much to do with me, a scruffy, old, mostly retired horse doctor who went around every so often to do whatever needed doing for the animals. The thing that struck you about the Betancourt place, though, was how neat and orderly everything was, especially the lawn, like a beautiful carpet, uniform and smooth. Betancourt style, I used to say, when things were extra orderly, like when I found myself lining up pill bottles or in some way making neat from a mess of some kind. Betancourt style. Of course, he was that way too, tidy and fit, and never a carefully trimmed hair out of place or trousers without a proper crease. Proper and stiff like a Marine sergeant. Anyway, Betancourt inherited a real maverick to his way of doing things when he moved to the country, a big, dirty yellow dog named Stanley. Stanley Betancourt what I'd call a compound dog, compounded of lots of parts, as most good country dogs seem to be, I suppose. But he seemed mostly a golden retriever with some terrier and some sheepdog. A big, rangy old fellow, with a Kenworth nose and dinner plate eyes set close together, so they looked as if they both were on the same side of his face, no matter which way you looked at him. Among his other such fine qualities, Stanley knew the important secrets of diplomacy, because he always made you feel like he was glad to see you no matter what. Stanley was there when Betancourt moved in, and he just never went away, and he seemed welcome enough as long as he looked and behaved respectably. On the occasion that I'd be called out to the Betancourt place to tend the horses, give them a shot or plaster an inflamed leg muscle— I'd look forward to visiting with Stanley, and I'd fish around in my pocket, down in the nails and lint and stuff, for a badly worn jelly bean or a stale piece of licorice that he'd work around in his mouth for a while, and we got along pretty well. I guess I wasn't surprised, really, when one day Betancourt called up and asked me to come get Stanley. Come get him and put him to sleep. That's something you never want to hear. So on the way out... I stopped at the store and bought a little bag of licorice jelly beans and stuck a few in my pocket. When I shut the gate and drove up to the barn, I noticed Stanley wasn't there to lick my hand and wag his tail, and somehow I felt a lot less welcome. I sat in my truck for a minute and wished, for one of the few times in my life, that I hadn't gone into veterinary medicine. Betancourt met me at the door to the barn. Thanks, Dan, he said. Looks like you'll earn your pay this time. I thought about that for a minute and said, well, there comes a time for all of us. Is he conscious? Can he move? He can. He looks all right, and he gets around. Betancourt glanced the other way when he spoke. Then? Well, he's lost control of his bladder, for one thing. He looked away again. Ah, I nodded. And he sort of pees and craps all over everywhere. Ah, I nodded some more thinking that such language sounded out of place for cleaned-up dandy like Betancourt. I can see how that would be a problem, I added, looking around the carefully groomed property. Not a blade of grass tilted out of position, not a piece of gravel misplaced or off-sized. Everything painted and varnished and put in its place just so, Betancourt style. So the problem is, he went on, He messed up some nice paint and some shrubbery in the lawn, and then we walk in the stuff and it gets in my house and my wife is getting mad as hell. Can you understand that? It's messing up some expensive carpets, just messing them up. I can understand that, I said. I have the same problem at my house, except my stuff isn't very expensive and my wife has been dead for seven years, but I can understand how that would be a problem. So we have to get rid of them, Betancourt said. There comes a time. At that moment, Stanley nudged the barn door open and eyed me suspiciously. I could see he knew something was up. Could see it in his face. Tired, head hanging. Could see he knew we were conspiring against him. Here, boy. I offered him a nice licorice jelly bean. He took it gingerly, then wolfed it down without taking his eyes from mine while I got out another. That's about it, then. I finished the thought. You want to say goodbye or anything? Of course not. He's just an animal, Dan. He doesn't know or care. I grunted something, 
snapped a leash onto Stanley's collar and walked him over to the pickup. I'll send you a bill, I mumbled as I held the door open and helped Stanley struggle up onto the seat one half at a time. Sorry about this, old pal, I said to him as I got in there too and started the engine. Betancourt already was lining up the gravel in the driveway with a chrome-plated rake covering up the tracks I'd made with my wheels. Damn you, I said out loud and scratched Stanley's big head. Suddenly I had to relieve myself and had a great urge to do it on Betancourt's lawn. Before long, we were back at my clinic where Stanley went on a clump of grass on the parking strip as a thousand other dogs have done. Good dog, I said, and we hurried inside so I could go too. I have three or four kennels that I maintain, mostly for sick dogs and cats that may have to stay over for treatment, and a fenced run outside, but I'm not really equipped to board animals and don't very often. There aren't many cases in which a small animal is better off in the frightening atmosphere of some strange cage than he is at home, surrounded by the familiar, so over the years I haven't had many inpatients. Stanley was too big for the kennels I have. He could stay in the fenced run, I thought, or he could stay in the house with me, which is, of course, what he did, and at no time did I even faintly entertain the thought of putting him to sleep. Now you listen to me, I said to Stanley in a scolding tone. You relieve yourself in the house and it's lights out. End of the line. You got that? He must have, because he waddled over and sat down on my foot and looked up, happy about whatever it was I was pretending to scold him about. I knew I'd have to explain to Betancourt some day, but I knew, too, I'd figure out how to do that when the time came. As it turned out, Stanley was a pretty good companion, and in the weeks that followed, he had very few accidents in the house, and he brought me a lot of happiness, as we seemed to have plenty in common, both satisfied to sit close together and doze in the afternoon sun, or go on not-too-brisk walks first thing in the morning. We ate at the same time, slept at the same time, and I hate to mention it, went to the bathroom more or less at the same time. On other occasions, he sat perched up on the seat of my pickup as I traveled about ministering to the sick and lame animals of my limited practice. I didn't think about the Betancourts very much, but I knew that sooner or later there could be some kind of confrontation over Stanley. I also knew that one day he would arrange for his own demise, all by himself, and I wouldn't have to worry about Betancourt. It came to a head one day when Stanley and I were making our rounds and we stopped at the diner out on the highway for lunch. I gave him a chewy thing to consider while I went inside for a bowl of soup and a cheese sandwich, and when I came out, I noticed one of Betancourt's expensive cars pulling into the parking lot. I wondered if he'd seen me, and I more or less sheepishly tried to stay out of sight by stepping behind a service van parked nearby and by taking a long way around to my truck. When I got there, Betancourt was there too, had opened the truck door, and was regarding Stanley, who, for the first time since he left Betancourt's place, looked pathetically beaten, head down, eyes evasive. I felt evasive too, embarrassed. Betancourt was dressed rather formally for the diner in a fancy riding costume, complete with shiny brown leather boots and funny breeches. Hello, Mr. Betancourt, I offered. Imagine me calling him Mr., but I felt guilty somehow for not carrying out his request, for not killing his dog, for heaven's sake. Dan, he acknowledged, hardly noticing me but watching Stanley closely. I felt sorry for the dog. He could see something was pretty wrong. Been riding, I guess, I said. Yes, riding. Is that Stanley? In the pickup? Uh, Well, yes, it is, isn't it? You see... I thought I paid you to put him to sleep, to kill him, Dan, he said softly. Uh, no, you never did. I never billed you for the job, because I didn't have anything to bill you for. He didn't say anything, so I just kept blundering on. Well, you see, Stanley's just a good old dog, and I didn't think you'd really care as long as you didn't have to pay for it and didn't have to see him around. I could hear my voice take on a pleading tone that I didn't like very much. Now, you lied to me, Dan. He was accusing me. Well, not not really, I said. No, you lied to me. You said you'd do a job for me. I distinctly remember that, and you didn't do it. I didn't charge you for it, either. No, but I don't like being lied to. This is quite upsetting. Upsetting for your profession. People have to depend on you. I always have. Was I wrong? I don't like this. 
I could feel a nice cheese sandwich and bowl of tomato soup start to go sour in my stomach and looked away at some gentle white clouds moving slowly over the roof of the diner. I thought we agreed, Betancourt went on. There comes a time when animals lose their usefulness. A time when they must be allowed to rest. I wonder if you've reached that point in your career. I tried not to listen. Tried to stay calm and tried to figure out a way to just climb in my truck and drive away. Of course, taking Stanley with me. You old fool, Betancourt was going on. Then I noticed Stanley. He had climbed down out of the pickup and had waddled around behind the service van to the back of Betancourt's expensive car, and I tried not to watch him, but as I stared straight at Betancourt, I could also see Stanley walking very slowly up behind him. He's going to bite him, I thought. Good. I hope he takes a big chunk. The Board of Licenses, Betancourt was saying something about the state board. The trouble with you old people is that you think it's cute to be just a little shady, just a little unethical. He was getting wound up tighter and tighter. I didn't care because Stanley was positioning himself behind Betancourt and I could see what he had in mind. He couldn't have been more on target with laser precision. Stanley put his head down and raised his rear leg and let go with a stream of yellow right into Betancourt's boot. Not just a drop or two, but a wonder-how-long-he-can-go stream that just kept on and on. I was aware that Betancourt had stopped speaking. His eyes glazed over, and he had stopped mid-word, then sort of stared beyond me into space. I didn't move, didn't speak, didn't breathe, and when Stanley had finished, he scratched his feet on the ground, shook himself all over, and trotted back to the pickup. Betancourt and I stood facing each other for what seemed like a long time, not until the sun went down exactly, and I thought he was waiting for me to say something to apologize, perhaps to call Stanley back out or to walk away. I didn't do anything, just stood there trying to stifle a smile, trying not to explode with laughter. I could feel my lips start to tremble, but I held on. Slowly, Betancourt's face turned to pain, the kind of pain that comes from deep in the soul. No physical hurt can cause that kind of pain. He turned on his dry foot and strode around to the driver's side of his expensive automobile. I could hear a little squishing sound with each step that he made, and I noticed there was a trail of wet footprints from the spot where he stood to where he got in his car. He fired up the engine, and with smoke boiling from his churning tires, he swung out onto the highway, and I looked after him for a long time. When I got back in my pickup, Stanley was sitting up on the passenger side, looking around, nose in the air, obviously quite pleased with himself. What pleased him even more was when I placed a handful of jelly beans on the dashboard in front of him and spread them in a neat line, Betancourt style. Licorice, of course.